and uh, welcome. Uh, thanks so very much for joining us. My name is Alex Neve, and I'm the Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada. And along with my colleague, uh, Julia Sanchez, uh, President and CEO of the Canadian Council for International Cooperation, uh, it's our uh, pleasure to uh, welcome you here uh, for this opportunity to first hear from uh, and then engage with uh, Mai Nakai, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association. Uh, I want to begin by, uh, by giving thanks to the Center for International Policy Studies uh, for uh, offering to uh, co-sponsor this event with us. We certainly appreciate uh, the, uh, the assistance, obviously appreciate the, the space, uh, and, uh, and really welcome that uh, support. And, uh, and I know that you're going to find this to be a, a stimulating, important, and very timely session, uh, because the human rights mandate uh, that Mr. Kai has within the UN human rights system deals with such fundamentally important rights, uh, peaceful assembly and association. And those are rights which I suppose in concert with, uh, or kind of think of it as a brother-sister right, freedom of expression, but, but together those rights uh, are, uh, are such essential rights around uh, citizen participation and, and a strong democracy and really are at the heart of the protection of the full range of other human rights. Uh, that having been said, it's, it's quite notable that it's only very recently uh, with, uh, uh, with the, the decision in, in 2011 to create uh, Mr. Kai's mandate uh, that there has been special attention to that within the UN human rights system. Uh, so, uh, MINA has been in the position since May 2011 and uh, has made uh, great use of the, uh, the two and a half years he's had uh, since that time. Obviously, he's dealing with issues around um, peaceful assembly and association and sort of the backdrop to that, of course, is issues around protest and, uh, uh, and, and the state of civil society. Uh, at a time when there is both great excitement and opportunity around those issues right around the world uh, and very serious challenges and restrictions uh, as well. Uh, so uh, obviously a very timely moment to be hearing from, uh, from my name his, his particular perspective and vantage point as, as the UN's leading expert on these issues uh, and to give us a sense of his, of his global overview. Um, Maida is absolutely the right man for this job. Uh, he uh, has demonstrated at national level in his home country of Kenya, but in so many uh, ways also in a variety of different international positions, uh, a strong and uh, unwavering commitment to defending and speaking out about human rights. Uh, and, uh, and he's bringing all of that to his, uh, to his work now. He's trained uh, as a lawyer, having studied in both uh, uh, Nairobi and Harvard, uh, and has worked uh, for a number of uh, organizations nationally and internationally uh, in the human rights field, including my own, Amnesty International. I'm very proud that he, uh, at one point, was, uh, was in charge of our Africa human rights program at our international office in London. Um, but he has also um, been the founder and executive director of the unofficial Kenya Human Rights Commission, and then chairman of the official Kenya National Human Rights Commission. He's been the executive director of the International Council on Human Rights Policy, uh, the Africa director of the International Human Rights Law Group, and he has held research fellowships at the Danish Institute for Human Rights, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the Trans-Africa Forum. Uh, so certainly as a man who has uh, has demonstrated his belief in and commitment to human rights in a whole variety of ways, and we're delighted to, uh, to have him with us today to offer reflections on the global state of respect for and challenges to uh, these key rights of peaceful assembly and association. Uh, Maida will speak for uh, between 35 40 minutes or so, uh, and then uh, very obviously we want to have ample time for uh, questions Thank you very much.
much Alex and, and also Julia for, for bringing me to Canada. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here, um, and especially to be in Ottawa. It's been a couple of days of, of a lot of bang, 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 back to back, bang, bang, bang meetings. So um, just, came from, just came from one at CEDA, which I understand is no longer CEDA, it's now part of the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And then tomorrow there's a number of meetings as well that are scheduled. I've been asked to speak about the right to protest, a worldwide perspective. Um, now it's a, it's an interesting topic, and, and, and it's a pity that this is not is happening when there are no protests outside here. Because I think you would have seen it. It's much better. It's much better. It's much more poignant when you see the protests going on. I was appointed in May 2011 as a special rapporteur. Uh, May 2011. And the backdrop of that, of course, was that was that in January 2011 was the big Arab Spring. It was the protest time, and that made my appointment and, and this mandate especially interesting, given that now there was a, a real concern about protests and about demonstrations and about assemblies. And in a sense, that that Arab Spring has defined a lot of protests since then, because it was, as, as Alex says, it was a moment of great opportunity moment of great expertise for nobody, almost nobody could have guessed that the Arab world would explode in such protests, in such organized, in a, such an organized manner that, that shook the very fabric of what we thought of the Arab world and Middle East and North Africa. But in a sense, the success or lack of the Arab Spring has also had a number of, of uh, bad turns and a lot of states have learned from the Arab Spring. And now what we're seeing is in a sense a clampdown against the right to protest in different parts of the world. And and I, I think and I, and I and the whole point of it is that is that I think a lot of states now are scared about what it could mean when you have protests around the world. Now our definition, my first report to the Human Rights Council was about best practice in terms of freedom of assembly and freedom of association. And the part about freedom of peaceful assembly one of the first things we said is that to have a peaceful assembly or a protest in that case, which and a protest, by the way, in this context, is a subset of assembly. Because assemblies can be in any sort of a place, but a protest is a very specific part of assembly. We said that you what, that you do not need to have authorization. That, you, that all you need at the best is notification. Now this is a this seems like a very small thing, but it's actually a very fundamental part. Of, of these rights. And this is actually looking at international law and international human rights law, that if the right is going to be exercised and it's a peaceful right, then you do not need to tell the state to ask permission from the state to exercise your rights. The state cannot grant you permission to exercise your rights. You can notify it so that you can then they can then be able to organize the arrangements around traffic, or around ensuring there's peace and law and order on that scale. But you do not, you cannot, you must not, you should not ever need authorization. That's an issue, of course, that's caused a lot of trouble across the world because most governments are very scared of the idea of their citizens protesting. And we've got to ask ourselves why governments are scared of protest. Because if a protest is, if a protest is going to be small, it's going to be irrelevant. You don't need to fear it. But generally speaking, many governments that close down, that don't allow for space, for citizens to engage, are then scared of protests because it will mean it, will, it will may shake the, the, the fabric of that regime and the government that exists. So it becomes a very important issue. But for us, it's very clear in the international law: you do not need to get authorization to be able to protest. And that's, that's that's one of the topics that I continuously engage with with states because so many of them cannot fathom that that they that their that their citizens can just go out on the street. And protest, they bring up other other rights and say, why should we? Uh, why why should they have the right to protest? What about traffic and the right to and the competing interests around it? But I think again, international law is very clear. If you look at the European Court of Human Rights, they've been very very clear. That the right to protest has as much right to public space as traffic, and you cannot choose one over the other. In fact, because one is a right of one is a human right, it in fact sometimes has precedence over the right to traffic, and it's fine. If traffic is is is, uh, is diverted, if traffic is stopped, 
And because once you're trying to express yourself on an issue, and you, of course you know if you've got a five, ten people who are protesting, they will not divert traffic, they will not affect traffic. It's easy to be able to move it. But when you have 15,000, 30,000, that's something that people are saying to the state. And the state should listen to that. When there are 50,000, 100,000, or like we saw in Tahrir Square, it's a million people. You cannot stop them and say, let's stop this because traffic has to move. Sorry. The important thing here is that people are saying something, and the fact that people have come to the streets is saying something about the, the lack of dialogue, and the lack of space for, between, and the, and the distance, really, between the government and the people of that country. So, that, so, so, so for me, that's a fundamental issue in terms of the right to protest. That it's, it, is an, it's, it is a way of expression, and it's a way of also telling the government what's going on. It can be avoided if governments were able to, or better able, to listen and dialogue with the citizens so they don't have to go to that extent of protesting. Now, the, the other part around that, of course, is that when, when many governments see people on the streets, their first reaction is to disperse them and say, we don't want, we, want, we can't have this, it's diverting, it's illegal, or as they say in my country, you are being paid by foreign masters to go out there to, to, to protest, so it must be stopped. So in that point, then, you've got to figure out that and I think this is where I always I tell states, I tell governments that, look, if you're better off allowing protests because you have a chance then to understand what people are feeling. And, and it's much better to have a protest that's peaceful than for you to go and stop it. Because once you stop it, or people, or you beat people up so badly, the chances of the next form of, of expression of it not being peaceful is quite high. So in a sense, it is in your interest to have a peaceful protest than not. So if people were coming out in their numbers, 50,000, 15,000, 30,000, let them be, let them be. And as we go through the whole concept of protest, we're seeing now a number of things that are happening. And there's a number of researches and studies that have been done across the world. And we're seeing very often, and anybody here who has been in a protest, and the other day I was in a, I was in a workshop where we're looking as, as a number of us at this right to protest and about how people protest. And we asked, the question was asked, when is the last time, who's been in a protest the last three months? And I still like ask everybody here, who's been in a protest the last three, six months? Good. I have. I'm very happy to say. I went, I went to the one against the M MPs in Kenya. Call them, they don't call them MPs anymore. They call them MPs in Kenya. They're so greedy. They just take all our money. And I was out in that protest. Because I think it's, a big, it's an issue that, 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 that we believe in, in very, very strongly. But it's important to know, in the context, of course, in many countries like it, like mine in Africa, once you, once you go on the streets and you've got a protest going, the biggest threat you have is not the people who are protesting. Oftentimes, it is the police. And when the police come up, when we, in this country, again, Kenya, we have this thing now, we're calling them Ninja Turtle suits. Our police were, were given these suits by foreign assistants, I must say, to foreign assistants, to arm themselves, and, and now they have this protective gear. There are two theories. The theory is that if, you, if police have protective gear, they will not hurt you. They will be less inclined to, to hit you because they feel protected. But I can tell you in Kenya, it gets worse because you have no place to fight back. So they come at you now with this protective gear and they come at you really hard. And it's made it worse for people to protest. But they beat us seriously. But it's always the police that start, in very many cases, that start the violence. And so in our concept of peaceful assembly, we always say that if the intention of the protest is peaceful, then it must be deemed to be a peaceful assembly. Now, human rights law protects peaceful assembly alone. If you're going to a, to a protest and you're carrying uh, uh, machetes and you're carrying sticks and other things, that's not protected by international human rights law. That's criminal. The police can arrest you and deal with you. But when you're going peacefully, the intention is peaceful, and then somebody in there decides that he, will, he or she will defend himself or herself, and there's a bit of violence. That does not make it a not a non-peaceful assembly. It's still a peaceful assembly. And the duty of the police is to find that person, take them out, and, and arrest them and charge them in court. And let the rest of the people who want to be peaceful continue. Studies are showing very clearly that right now that, in, that the maximum number of people who are going to be violent in any protest is maximum 10%. Or normally 3%, 4%. Even the worst of them, most people who go to protest, most, I really, uh, yeah, most people who go to protest that are big, actually go to one, are trying to do it peacefully. 
So you can actually remove those people out there. And there's a lot of developments going on now in terms of how to police protests. And that's one of the new areas that I think is, a, is an interesting area. How do you police a protest? Where I come from, when police see a crowd of people, they just charge at you. And the last one I was at, I saw police, you know, police. And it's interesting because as technology is increasing, um, the police and as international assistance and co cooperation is increasing, now police are getting better and better armed. So we are finding now that they have they come out with dogs, they came out with horses, and then they have this big, uh, to the, remember, I don't know if some of you who saw, remember those trucks that were seen in the apartheid era in South Africa. Those trucks now have been exported to most of Africa from South Africa. They're now all over. And those are just really the same, those, the, the water tanks, trucks that were there. And what the police do, they, they first spray water in you. When you don't run away enough, and they go back and start putting chemicals in the water. And those chemicals are really draining. They hurt you, they, they really tear you apart. And it's really, really dangerous. There's a lot of studies and a lot of movements now going on about what is the non-lethal weapons. How should police deal with, with protests that they want to disperse without hurting people? Again, in many parts of Africa, the first, the first thing they use is tear gas. And tear gas, I can tell you, is not non-lethal. It's very lethal. I don't know how many of you have tasted tear gas, but it can knock you down very easily. Really, easy. and it can actually kill you. It's not, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not as simple as just tear gas, people think. And then many times, in many car countries, after tear gas, they start shooting live bullets. And they don't shoot above, they shoot into the crowd. And you see that happening. And, and I've been talking to people from Ethiopia especially, who tell me about the, the protests they had in 2005, when they were after an election. There's about a million people in the streets of Addis Ababa. And what scared them is that the government did not put police to, to stop them. But they went up to top of buildings and started sniping and shooting at people, one after the other. And that was the most scary thing that ever happened. When you're walking with people on the street and then they, and then they stop by shooting you, and people just fall over and can't see who's shooting. It's a very, very scary thing. That's not how you deal with protests, of course. That is illegal, that is against international human rights law, and that's something that should be sanctioned as we go. And so it always worries me when I see that despite all that, Ethiopia is still one of the favored children of international assistance. And most people still tout Ethiopia as the, as the example of how to do development, even though they're killing their own people. There's no space anymore to do dissent and to, and to even run civil society in, in Ethiopia. So those are some of the fundamentals we're looking at, at protests and how, and how it goes. Of course, when we look at best practice, then we can move it a little bit and say that there are, there are, there are ways in which you can make it. Of course, this is, must be in states that are willing to have discussions with the protesters. And we recommend very highly that if you can, you have a tripartite agreement between your, the local authorities, the police, and the protesters. They can sit and talk and agree on the route and other things of that sort. That happens in certain countries, and I know it happens, for example, in the city of Bern in Switzerland, and, I, and, and the local authority. Uh, uh, the, the town clerk is a good friend of mine, and I really enjoy talking to him about what, how he, how he polices and deals with protests. But in many countries, that's not likely to happen. In many countries, you find again there is very little, there's absolutely no dialogue and absolutely no trust between the police and protesters. So that doesn't happen. So this, so that, at that rate, therefore, we say that if spontaneous protests happen and they are peaceful, the key word for us always in international human rights law is peaceful. That if the, the protest is peaceful, with notification, preferably. If not, and spontaneous, that's still okay. It's still a legal protest of international human rights law. So that's the key thing. So because there's sometimes so little trust between police and the authorities and protesters that you can't even have that discussion. And there are many challenges that that, that, that we find. And I was, I was in, I, I did a mission to the United Kingdom this year. And I was talking to some of the protest groups, and some of the things, some of the tactics that have been put in by the UK are very, are very scary in terms of, of how they deal with protesters. One of the means that they do, one of the things that they do is, is that they, uh, they infiltrate protest groups. And as I know, if some of you have read the Guardian newspaper, it had a lot of exposés about the undercover police who go who join groups, NGOs, mostly environmental groups that like to protest. They join them, and as though they're activists, spend nine years, ten years, form relationships, have children, and then they're called off and they disappear. And that's a big issue, it's a big violation of the trust that the state should have 
with people. They never arrest anybody. They never, none of these groups have ever accused of committing any crimes. Nobody in those groups. In fact, what you find is people, members of the group say, it's often those policemen who try and incite them to commit violent acts. And then they come in, and so you ask yourself, and I, I remember having a meeting with the Minister for Home Affairs in, in the UK, and I asked, how can, you, how can the state pay for somebody to go in and destroy lives as, as they've done in the UK? They can't ask that question. And, when, and this, is, this is one of the things, one of the new realities that we've got, is that the state, because it fears protests, is now infiltrating groups, and is causing mistrust, and is hurting the right itself. And one of the phenomena that we find within the right to protest is that when that the the way the state deals with protest is that it doesn't see it as a right. It doesn't see it as a human right to be enjoyed by citizens to express themselves, to assemble because they have the right under law to, 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 to protest and to <coughs> assemble. The many, many countries see the right to protest as a law and order issue. So as soon as a protest, a protest is going to be happening, the first question is, how do we maintain law and order? Not how do we facilitate protests. So our, our recommendations have been very clear on this, that let us try and get the state to facilitate protests, to facilitate assemblies. And when you find you facilitate them, you actually find there's less chaos, there's less, uh, there's less tensions. And people will, will sit around and go away after a while. You know, If they don't achieve, there are not many people, they'll go. If they have spoken, they feel good, and they can go. <coughs> The other, and the other issue we found, the other phenomenon we found in the UK is the kettling issue. I hear it's very big in Canada as well, which is which we, there's a there's a decision by the European Court of Human Rights which says that that, that it's fine to kettle, it's not inhuman. Uh, my my view is completely opposite. I think kettling is 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 uh, is human. I think it is it is uh, it is, uh, it, is, uh, it, is it is indiscriminate. Just picks up people and holds them for hours and hours and holds them there. And, they, and again, I heard stories in the UK about people who have been kettled as they're walking by the street. Japanese tourists who are walking around are kettled. They're caught by the protests. They're kettled and kept there for four or five hours without water, in the sun, doing nothing. And, and we, I find that to be a violation. There must be other ways in which police can protest without kettling. Kettling is inhuman. It is, it is indiscriminate. It doesn't say who's committing a crime or who's not committing a crime. If you happen to be in the protest, you are seen to be an offender because you've got a, because the police have a law and order mentality. And the other one other thing that also becomes important is that from kettling, at least in the UK, what the, what people were doing is that as they're leaving, they have to leave all their details with the police, your address, where you live, they take a picture of you, and then they maintain this database of protesters, and then they watch you, and then and that is absolutely a violation of privacy, but also a violation of human rights. And it's one of the phenomena that are coming on um, within 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 uh, within the world as, as states try to grapple with protests. Instead of embracing protests, they're grappling with them. So they are doing all these illegal acts. And I'm just saying this because I know Canadians like to protest, especially, especially the ones in Quebec like to protest a lot. And I'm hoping you can tell the lesson that the law is very clear that kettling is wrong, surveillance is wrong. The police have a right to to, to prevent crime. But protesting is not a crime. And when you criminalize that, you're criminalizing human rights, a human right. And it's wrong to do so. And it's not, it's absolutely inappropriate. So there's a lot of surveillance in many, many places. People are watching, and all the cameras, you know, the UK is probably the most camerized uh, city, uh, country in the world. There's so many cameras everywhere. But they've been able to watch, and there are many instances as well where I met people who said that before a protest was going to happen, the police would knock on the door in the evening and say, we hear you want to protest, we are watching you, if you go, you'll be arrested. So there's a lot of developments that are coming up that are illegal that the people are coming to. That is the sad story, because one of the interesting sides of, of the United Kingdom is Northern Ireland. And, and, and it was fascinating for me to see how much change and how much, how much better policing is in Northern Ireland than it is in London and other parts. And it's a product, of course, of the Good Friday Agreements that were signed in Northern Ireland. And because of the particular historical uh, circumstances in Northern Ireland, that, they, that the right to protest is within, is a right and treated as a right by the Northern Ireland police. And they've, got, they've gone through all this training and they facilitate. And one of the major uh, phenomena about, about, about Northern Ireland, particularly Belfast, if you want, if you want to be specific, is that Belfast has 3,000 marches every year. 
every year. And let me say 3,000. There's 365 days in a year. There are 3,000 marches in Belfast every year. And that is mostly, so there are many concurrent ones that happen at the same time. And the, actually, this, they call it the marching season. It starts in, in between April in between April and about August. There's a lot of marching. That, and there's a friend of mine who, a friend of mine who's a priest who has this joke that, that in, uh, in, Northern, that the, in Northern Ireland, they have a very short year. It's, they go from January, February, March, 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 <laughs> and stick there. So, they really march. And, but some of those marches are, 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 most, some of those marches are very, are, are, are very are different. And they're very interesting in the sense that, that um, because they're so conflictual, they have set up a parades commission that now does the management of who's going to march where and how. It's an independent commission of the police, of the government, of the different sites in, the, in, in Northern Ireland. So it's a, it's, it gets a lot of flack from every side. Everybody believes it is biased, which means it's doing its job right. I think everybody thinks it's biased. But it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult job of saying, we've got to go, this for this march, you can't take that street, because if you take that street, you are going to affect the Catholics, or you're going to affect the Protestants, and it's not the right way to do it. So it's a bit, it's a very, it's a very unique way of trying to manage protests. And this is where, in the sense that you see that you need to notify the authorities in a, in a country as divided, as volatile, as as difficult as Northern Ireland. You really do need to notify. And it's not of authorizations, still a notification. But the but the parades commission has the right to tell you, sorry, you can't take that route. You can't do that much today because three other marches are happening on that same route this, on this day. So it has to be, they have to be able to manage it. But it was fascinating for me to see how much better the policing has been. The police in Northern Ireland do not use tear gas. They never use tear gas. They don't use dogs, they don't use horses. So they go in and they try and deal, they try and talk to the people and try and marshal them by sheer force of numbers and put them in the right, in the right way. There have been use of uh, rubber bullets once in a while but that's been that's even that's going down. And then most important about Northern Ireland that there's an accountability mechanism. Any any bullet, any uh, rubber bullet or real bullet sh spent and shot must be accounted for, and somebody must explain how it was used, where it was used, and what happened. There's a real accountability mechanism, which makes it much easier for people to have trust that they, they can exercise their rights. So that's one of the phenomena where. I think good practice or good emerging practice is Northern Ireland. And it's absolutely amazing for those of us old enough to remember Northern Ireland in the old days that it's moved so far. It really is done very, very well in terms of allowing the culture and the right to protest going on. Then the other examples, I remember I was in, I was in Mongolia earlier this year and uh, one of the fascinating things was a big meeting of, uh, hosted by the president of Mongolia. And we finished the meeting and, Aung San Suu Kyi was also there, and we came out to have this group picture. And right, literally, you know, 50 meters away from us was a group of protesters against the president. And what was fascinating about it for me was that the police had no guns, no batons, no sticks. They just stood and didn't allow the protesters to pass them. That's all they did. So people stood by, they shouted, they screamed, they had bullhorns, and so on the president. We went outside, we took our picture, and then we went. And I thought so to myself, you know, my goodness, could this ever happen in my country? Can imagine you come there and tell Uhuru Kenyatta, go home, go to Haiti. You'll be shot. You'll be shot. You'll be shot. And that's really fascinating to see that 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 country. Mongolia is not a first world country. It's a poor country, surrounded by China and Russia. Is able to marshal this and move this this the process forward. There is hope, and all this is about leadership. To be honest, the whole point of this thing is that when you have leadership that is committed to, to allowing the people to be free, then you find there's not much conflict within society. That you can address these conflicts much, much easier through dialogue and discussions and through allowing people to express themselves even when you disagree and you can have it going, you can have it go well. And so that's some of, some of the things that, that we're finding then in, in, uh, in, in protest, about, about the right to protest, is that, and we, have, we were asking ourselves the other day, me and my team, whether, whether protests have risen or they have gone down in the last five visit. They have gone up, or what? Why do we hear of them so often? And and partly, I think, is that the world has become smaller. We're hearing a lot more about protests everywhere, and there's a lot of different protests on different things. Sometimes we have big debates. I remember having a big debate about the uh, the the protest in the mine in South Africa, whether that was a peaceful protest or not, because the pictures that came out of that mine, the platinum mine, 
was people armed with 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 uh, pangas and machetes and, and and sticks and you wonder is this does this fall under the and then was shot of course by the police and so we we we, we took we took um we took issue with the police shooting but we weren't quite sure whether it was peaceful or not there are many many dynamics around that as you as as, as you deal with a protest but i think one of the things is that is that and when i've when i've since then engaged some of the some of the miners is that they felt they were defending themselves that the police had beaten them up before they needed to defend themselves so there's a whole issue about how we protest and how how the state reacts to protest because if people feel they have to defend themselves then it will likely get violent and likely become you'll have loss of life and i think one of the things we don't want to do is that people exercising their rights should not die for it if in fact we should celebrate those exercising these rights rather than rather than kill them for it so part of that discussion is going is an interesting one in terms of how you deal with the dynamics, the underlying issues that are that are going on. So, so it's some of the dynamics. I mean, I've sp I spent some time today with uh, with some of the of, of Canadian the First Nations, uh, the Canadians of the First Nations, and and interestingly about the way their protests happen and how different it seems the Canadian police deal with those protests compared to other Canadians. And that's an issue for me that's of interest. Uh, that if that there's a absolute seems to be an absolute discrimination. In terms of how policing is done for First Nations and for the other Canadians, so I don't know who's more Canadian than the other, who came here first. But it seems to be there's a that that to me is a, is is a huge problem because one of the things in human rights is that you ask, we ask and demand that treatment should be equal. Equality before the law is fundamental. And one of the things, by the way, we have noticed when we have studied the world of protests, okay, that there's never ever been a protest. That is pro government anywhere in the world that's ever been broken up or people beaten. Ever. Anywhere in the world. Those are always allowed. They even give police protection. Sometimes they give them police bands to lead them to go where they are going. Always given that. And those they can be large sometimes. But those are always allowed. It's when the issue becomes anti government dissenting that, that then the police start breaking them up. And that's the problem that, that we should not be concerned about the content. Of the protest, we should be concerned about the protest itself, because we don't have to agree with people. We don't have to agree. That's fine, and but we should allow people to express themselves, whether we agree with them or not. That's what's fundamental. Because one day your view, you you, you might feel so strongly about your view, and nobody will let you go out there because they don't agree with you. And I think that's a fundamental part. That we are asking for equal treatment between how the state treats pro-government protests as well as the way it treats anti-government protests. The content is not enough. And in many countries, we're finding that there's a lot of laws are being put in about the content. We're having all these things, and you know, I, I, as you follow, some of you follow the, the pride parades in former Soviet Union that are not allowed because they are seen as as uh, as uh, promoting immorality. I just don't, I always find it strange, by the way, how, how people think you can promote immorality by people marching. I don't understand how, how that promotes immorality. Still don't get it, and people feel, oh, by promoting LGBTI rights or people expressing themselves as LGBTI people, it is going to stop, going to spoil society. It's, it's a sense for me that always baffles me that people think that human beings are so fickle. That if I see somebody who's gay, if I touch him, I'll become gay. You know, I always wonder why people worry about it. If people want to be gay, that's their problem. That's their right. That's their celebration. It's great. We don't have we don't have to agree with it, and especially in Africa, the Arab world, this issue of LGBT has become a significant issue. And it's an issue that has to be opened up because it doesn't affect you if you doesn't affect you. Let people want if people want to be gay, let them be gay. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be our concern, we shouldn't care about us at all. But that's the that's when the problem becomes us looking at the content rather than the process. And that's when it becomes difficult. And I think as you all know, historically some groups have been marginalized, have been hated, have been yeah, have been disapproved of, and, and, and coming from me as, a, as an African, I, 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 I suddenly feel very strongly that I know I could not vote before because I was black, I, and I was seen as subhuman. I am seen as human, I can vote. So I, so I have no problem with extending that discussion to gender, to race, to gender, to race, and to, and to LGBTI. It's the same, the, the paradigm is the same. I think the, the, ba the basis of thinking and theor the, the, the theoretical framework Exactly the same for all of them. I want to, let me leave it there for now, unless I, I, so I can have discussions about the right to protest. 
But I but I want to I want to encourage us all to protest. It's a great thing. And if you can protest, especially when you're not going to be beaten, then please go out even more. And um, and the other one last thing I want to say, because this is something that I've done in my report. Some things called blanket bans, where again to and this happens again with many pride parades, where the state doesn't want to allow pride parades because some people want to counter demonstrate against them. So they just ban blanketly all protests and say for one month there will be no protests, whether it's pro gay rights or anti gay rights. That is not how what the law says. That's anti gay rights. Blanket bans are wrong. Or saying that you know, some some countries are very clever. They say well, yes. You can protest, but you've got a square about 20 miles away from everywhere else. You can go and protest there, you know. Again, we are very clear. Protest should be within sight and sound of the target. If the target is parliament, you should be able, the parliamentarians should be able to hear you and see you. That is what international law says. So this idea of putting places far away where you can't be seen. Well, the protest is fine, we allow you, but go as far as possible so you cannot disturb us. That is not right. And so there's all these mechanisms that states are coming out with because they are scared of their people. And the bottom line has got to be, if you have got a government that has got legitimacy, has got support of the people, you should never, ever fear people coming out the street saying whatever they want to say. That is their right, you should encourage it. Thank you very much.